So today I'm going to finish off my uh, short series of uh, small documentaries, tours really, of uh, the Gulf of Morbihan and the megalithic structures within. Uh, we're going to start this morning with Loch Maria Cairn, uh, great tombs and a huge cairn, uh, all gone now, except for the tomb, one tomb. And then we're going to cross over to Arzon, where we're going to see what tombs will have looked like. And we're going to finish with just a, a, a small glimpse of uh, Chateau de Cicino. Uh, this is a, a precursor to what we're going to be visiting over the next few weeks. Before I do or say anything, please excuse my hair. I'm suffering from uh, uh, confinement miseries. I can't get a rendezvous with my barber, my hair cutter, my hairstylist. So please forgive me. It is what it is. Welcome to another episode on my uh, virtual tours of Brittany. Um, today we're going to visit Loch Maria Kerr, an archaeological site open to the public, um, home to the largest standing stone in the world, 21 metres high. Um, in, this, in the course of the documentary you'll see uh, a graphic image showing you how tall that is in relation to a human being. Um, it was one of many stones that stood there at this particular location, uh, right next to a huge cairn, a huge tomb, buried and covered in stone. Um, the uh, stone heap, the cairn, will have been 80 feet high and 460 feet long. Um, but it wasn't the only one of its kind here in Brittany. There are many like it. In fact, uh, the second video, or the second portion of this video today, will be visiting a place called uh, Le Petit Mont at Arzon. And uh, Arzon is uh, a, a very interesting location in its own right. It's unique. Another large tomb, in fact, at Arzon, you can see the cairn is still there, and you can see the entrance portal to the, the tomb as it was. However, what's happened is in 1942, the Germans arrived, and uh, they turned this particular tomb, because of its strategic location on the peninsula, turned it into an observation bunker. So they took out the archaeology, and they filled it with reinforced concrete, turned it into what was then a high-tech um, uh, observation post. The uh, third portion of the uh, video today is actually just a short visit to Chateau de Cicino. It was uh, home to a man who would become Henry, Henry IV of England. Uh, but uh, he was a friend, family member of the Dukes of Brittany um, during the Wars of the Roses in Britain. And uh, he found safety, he found succor, um, he found time to reinforce and, and gain political allies by staying in Brittany at Chateau de Cicino. Um, it was a, 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 a fortress that was originally built in the 13th century, but what you see today in this short clip is, is a 15th century fortress. Um, it grew up uh, in large part because Brittany is famous for its salt, its blue salt. If you eat blue salt, it probably came from Brittany. And uh, certainly throughout history, from the time of the Romans right up until the present day, it's been a very valuable commodity indeed. You all know, I'm sure, that salt... Uh, is a word we use today, but the Romans uh, would have used the word sell, and we use salary um, to tell us that uh, we're going to be paid something, money nowadays, of course, in those days it could have been salt. Um, but uh, Brittany became uh, 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 very, very important in salt trade in, in Europe, and one of the reasons why the Romans came and defeated a, a Gallic tribe called the Veneti. I'll be talking about them a little bit more. Um, on another episode when we visit the town of Van that gets its name from the Veneti, not Venetians, the Veneti. And in the Gulf of Morbihan, you'll see uh, uh, some images of the Gulf of Morbihan today. There was a great naval sea battle, the only recorded naval sea battle between the Roman Empire and Gallic tribes. And it happened here in Brittany, it happened in the Gulf of Morbihan, and it happened off the coast of Arzon and Loch Maria Kerr. Um, so just another little hint uh, as to how important this area has been historically, um, not just to our ancient fathers, but to our Roman forefathers, and of course to uh, uh, a more recent, a more recent uh, medieval aristocracy. So, little glimpses to uh, uh, what we're doing today. Um, enjoy the show. Uh, I will say that next week my wife and I were going up to Le Mont Saint-Michel, and we're going up to the D-Day beaches. Um, we're going to visit Saint-Malo, 
Um, so some places that are dear to our hearts as tour guides, we're going to take you to, and we're going to give you a virtual tour whilst we're there. So something for you to look forward to, I hope. Um, many of you already as well have uh, contributed to uh, the making of these these videos as, as i said before it, it only takes a day for me to run out and do this but uh, then another half a day editing and getting it online etc getting it ready for you all to view um uh, if anybody else would like to donate or if you would like to donate again please do thank you very very much in advance for having done so it's much appreciated and uh, it means that we can carry on doing these i hope that uh, you get to enjoy these uh, uh, informal uh, tours over a cup of coffee on a Saturday or a Sunday morning. Um, but uh, if you'd like to contribute, please do so. Uh, underneath the video, you will find a link to my PayPal account, and you can donate there if you wish. Um, alternatively, on my Facebook page, where you will probably see the uh, advance notice of this video, there is also a link to our PayPal account. So whatever you can give is, is much, much, muchly uh, uh, appreciated. Uh, otherwise, Enjoy the show. Um, it's, it's been fun doing these. Today I was out and about with another of our Rick C's colleagues, a man called Nigel Howes. He works in Scotland. Some of you will know him, I'm sure. Some of you will have worked or been with Tony, my wife, uh, touring Paris, touring Eastern France, touring uh, uh, Loire Valley with her on Rick C's buses. And I know many of you have been with me in Britain. Um, it's a joy to actually be doing some form of guiding, albeit on the internet at the moment. So I hope you enjoy this anyway. A uh, little taste of Rick Steve's tour guides, having a bit of fun. Um, much more to come. Enjoy. Here's an aerial picture of the site of Loch Maria Cairn. You can see the uh, range of the great uh, uh, cairn and the smaller tomb to the right. So this morning we've come down to a marvellous site called Loch Maria Caer on one of the peninsulas uh, on southern Brittany. And uh, what you're looking at, of course, looks like a pile of stones. Um, essentially that's what it is. But if you can imagine this pile of stones going up, 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 up into the sky, probably 80 feet tall, from one end to the other. 460 feet long. So this was a massive structure. Um, it dates to about 7,000 years ago. So we're looking at about five, five and a half thousand BC. Very early indeed in the period of uh, megalithic structures. And I'll explain this feature to you in a moment. Okay, so here we are. We're here at Loch Maria Kerr. It's a wonderful megalithic site here on a peninsula here in Brittany, as I've already said. Um, I indicated to you the pile of stones, a cairn, um, as they call it here, as you would uh, recognise it as being, as we walked in. And much of the cairn itself has disappeared. It's been quarried out 80 feet high, 460 feet long, um, it's been eradicated. In fact, until uh, uh, just a couple of decades ago, it was being used as a local car park. Now, underneath that cairn, there was this structure. Archaeologists have discovered it. They have uh, uh, identified it as being another tomb. And inside, there are some very special features. And uh, I promised you earlier on in a previous video that uh, we would do this. We're going to go inside and have a look at this one in just a few minutes. But I want you to look over there. That's a massive standing stone, 21 meters tall, uh, about 350 tons in weight. That makes it the largest standing stone, the largest men here uh, in Europe. It's lying on its side, it's broken into several pieces, but that was one of 18 such standing stones here on this one site, in this one location, on this one peninsula. And uh, we'll go and explore that in a moment, but for the moment we're gonna go into the tomb. Okay, we're going into the tomb. You can see these large stones supporting the capstones on top, the roof stones. You've heard me describe these before. Now you can actually see them. Large upright stones lining a passage with the uh, ceiling or roof stones, capstones above us. All granite, Bresson is famous for its granite, 
And this passage, which makes it a passage grave, leads us into the actual area of the tomb itself. But if you notice there, look at that. You can see the inscriptions on this one large stone at the end. But that's not the only one. If I look up, you can see carvings on this stone too. In fact, that looks like large stone axe, which is exactly what it is. And in fact, that's a pattern, that's a motif that you find replicated on standing stones all over Brittany. Remember, I've said it before, 80% of the world's standing stones are found here in Brittany. So here in Brittany, we find patterns, we find alignments, and we find carvings and engravings on these incredible structures. Here, the uh, archaeologists actually interpret this feature as being uh, uh, a field of wheat. I don't know how they come to that conclusion, but uh, I guess you could draw that conclusion from it. Uh, but the obvious ones are axe heads. They're actually arrowheads. They're also uh, shepherd's crooks that are replicated from one site to another. Um, this particular stone site is interesting because one of these stones, this one, the capstone, uh, is part of a larger feature, and we'll go and have a look at that in a moment. So at this point I want to emphasize something rather interesting uh, uh, about the site here at Loch Marriacare and about the great men here, the great standing stone. Uh, obviously broken now, uh, broken 700 years after it was originally uh, erected. We think it, it probably fell over because of uh, uh, tectonic uh, activity, i.e. an earthquake. Um, that seems to be the general conclusion to this day. However, um, you'll see there's one diagram that uh, uh, is in the video here that portrays some inscriptions on the larger stone and the one that would have been standing next to it, possibly some of the others too. Now, first of all, those two inscriptions are very, very interesting because uh, when the stone, the large stone fell, that inscription was broken. It broke in two. And uh, there's a portion of that in the... Actually, as the the the, the uh, uh, slab, the roof slab in the tomb, right there on the site next to the standing stone. Another portion of that inscripted uh, uh, stone or stella, as they call it, uh, it was found on the island of Gavrinides, which is a small island. It was probably just a hill seven and a half thousand years ago, seven thousand years ago, um, just about four or five miles from Loch Maria Care. They found it also as a as a as a tomb roof slab. Um, and uh, it's interesting, isn't it, how archaeology can piece these things together so nicely. Because it's a broken inscription, they know that, just like a jigsaw puzzle, that they fit together. And they know that it came from that large standing stone because the mineralogy is perfect. Those standing stones there come from another little rock outcropping a few miles away. Um, so geologically, it's a unique thing. And uh, the fact that we have the jigsaw puzzle um, that uh, is made of the same minerals tells us it comes from that large standing stone. So two sites have used a portion of that fallen standing stone. That tells us the standing stone was there first and the tombs came later. But it's this constant reuse of archaeology which I find utterly fascinating. But of course, I shouldn't really. Stone can be reused over and over and over again. Um, it, Raises the other question, of course, are standing stones, were they all covered in inscriptions? Um, I think the, the, the school of thought is out on that one. Uh, certainly here in Brittany, where there are so many standing stones, uh, there are many stones that have inscriptions on them. Not that sort of geometric pattern. This is really an oddity at Loch Maria Care, because that geometric pattern, as you can see in the diagram, is rather odd. Um, it's, it's, it's extremely odd. There's nothing else like it in the ancient world. Um, however, the carvings, the inscriptions that we see later that you saw in the tomb of shepherd's crooks, of, of wheat sheaves, of uh, uh, axe heads, those are all quite crude, quite rounded, quite, uh, uh, quite a different form of style um, than the original inscription on that large stone would have been. Um, were other stones covered in inscriptions? Let's go back to that question. Yes, there were many stones covered in inscriptions. In fact, many of those that have survived, the elements, we find inside tombs, face down, perhaps in the ground. Um, and uh, it's only because they're face down or in tombs, protected from the elements, that those inscriptions have survived. Now, in Britain, where we have very few standing stones relative to what we have here in Brittany, there are 
a tiny number of stones in Britain, and I'm talking, on, you can count them on one hand, where we find inscriptions or, or carvings on those stones. Um, does that mean that all of those standing stones that you see in fields all over the British Isles were, were not inscribed? No, it doesn't. Um, after 6,000 years, six and a half, seven thousand years of Mother Nature throwing the rain, throwing the sleet, throwing the hail um, at those standing stones in isolation in fields, whatever was there has been eroded long ago. The few instances that we find of standing stones with inscriptions on them are once again stones in fields that were face down um, in the British Isles. Here in Brittany we find a lot of stones, particularly in tombs, that have been inscribed. So were the stones all uniformly inscribed in something? We don't know. Were there lots more than we have today? Yes, absolutely. In the British Isles, were there more than we have today inscribed? Yes, absolutely. So. Think about that. And also I want to re-emphasize the points I make, uh, make on this video. Um, the whole of Western Europe was covered in these tombs, in stone uh, uh, structures of some form. What we have left today is a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of those that existed four, five, six, seven thousand years ago. Bear that in mind. It changes your viewpoint on Western Europe. Once again, there's the uh, tomb. Um, it's called the Table de Marchand. Merchant's table. Um, was it ever used as a merchant's table? We don't know. Uh, it's obviously been used for 7,000 years, primarily as a tomb. Uh, was it used as a tomb for much of its early life? Possibly not. We call them passage graves today because that's our interpretation of them. And because at some point in time they, they contained grave goods, they contained human remains. But were they originally built for that purpose? There is some doubt about that these days. Uh, there are no contemporary, there are no signs of contemporary uh, uh, archaeological evidence, uh, i.e. that was the tomb built at the same time as bones were interred. There's no evidence that, of that. In fact, in most cases in these tombs, uh, the bones were placed in them up to 300 years later. So we call them passage graves today. Were they passage graves originally? We may never know. But you can imagine this massive structure, once again, 460 feet long. You can see a part, portion of it here, covered in stones, stretching away into the distance, covering that other lump, which was another tomb, inside a massive pile of stones, the cairn. All of those stones gone. But then alongside it, we had 18 of these. This one was erected about 7,000 years ago. 700 years after it was erected, it came down, it fell, and broke. Look at the size of it. 330 to 350 tons in weight, which in turn then throws up all sorts of questions. How was it moved? How were its uh, long-lost cousins moved? Because they've gone. You can see the, uh, the base where the stones would have stood. In fact, there's some more there stretching away, 18 in total. Now, how were these stones moved? I've already described to you how the smallest stones were moved. When we were up at Montneuve the other day, um, I showed you how they were moved, how they were even taken out of the rock, uh, quarried. This particular stone, and it, obviously the ones that were originally adjacent to it came from a rock outcropping, a granite outcropping about uh, eight kilometers away. So it, it was moved quite a distance. Um, 350 tons, I'm rounding the number up. How did they get this one here? Well, probably using the same techniques as the, uh, 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 its smaller cousins all over Brittany, i.e. rollers, tree trunks, uh, animal labor, domesticated cattle. But that's still a huge achievement, getting this thing here. Archaeologists are puzzled by it. It's also a puzzle because this is one of the oldest standing stones in Western Europe. 7,000 years ago, it didn't have many cousins in this part of the world. All the other stones that were erected in this era came after this one, which makes it very interesting indeed. Now, in the distance, you can see the water. That's the Gulf of Morbihan. 
we'll be talking about that in a little while. But I want you to understand the enormity of this. The world's largest single standing stone, two beautiful tombs buried underneath a pile of stones that reached up into the sky 80 feet. This was a very, very, very important structure. Today we talk about sites. Notice the uh, carvings, inscriptions in the stones or on the stones to the left hand side. Very geometric, very interesting patterns, not like the carvings or inscriptions inside the tombs. But I want you to understand that the sites that we've paid to come into today, it's an organised archaeological site. But the landscape of Western Europe 7,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, was covered in stones. Covered in stones. I want you to understand that. So this is Loch uh, Marikir the name of the village. That tomb is called the Tabla de Marcha and here we have Europe's if not the world's largest standing stone. On its side as I say it collapsed 700 years after it was initially erected so it's been lying there in place now for 6,000 years. Here's an aerial view of the Gulf of Morbihan. You'll see the peninsula on the left. This is where we've just come from. That's where the Loch Care is. And in fact, in those fields is the stone site we visited. To the right is another peninsula, and this is Arzon. And uh, that's where we're headed next. Uh, the Gulf is the inland sea that you see in the distance, peppered with thousands of small islands. Beautiful area. So here at Arzon, you can see the great uh, Le Petit Mont, another tomb, uh, very similar to the one that uh, would have been at Loch Mariacare before it was quarried out. However, here you can see um, that the tomb has been disturbed by Germany during World War II. They created an observation bunker inside the tomb, hence the steps and the reinforced concrete. So welcome to uh, Arzon, that's the name of the community, it's a little port here on the uh, uh, Gulf of Morbihan in Brittany. Um, this is a, a second peninsula, this peninsula that we're standing on now connects to the one that we were at earlier on this morning, Loch Maria Care. Two peninsulas that come together, uh, that at one point in time created a land bridge. However, we're here to see this, Le Petit Mont. And made, of course, as you can see, it's a, it's a pile of stones. It's exactly what I was describing that would have existed at Loch Maria Care, where we had the tombs, two tombs covered in a large pile of stones at Care. This was also a tomb, a single tomb, and uh, underneath it were the remains of our forefathers, our ancestors. However, during World War II, 1942, something peculiar happened. The Germans arrived in this part of the world in strength. And uh, they wanted to use some of these high points as observation posts to uh, defend themselves against Allied, in particular the Royal Air Force incursions. And uh, you can see what they did. They hollowed out the archaeology. They took out the insides of this tomb and they infilled with concrete, reinforced concrete in fact. They turned it into an observation bunker of their own. So no longer a tomb, but 
an observation from Cur courtesy of World War II. This is what I talk about a lot with regards to the reuse of archaeology and uh, in particular stone built structures. The great cathedrals of today, what will they be 500 years from now? Already here in Britain, cathedrals are no longer really churches, they're more tourist attractions. Um, but it is really interesting to consider what they may be 500 or 1,000 years from now. This tomb, just like Loch Maria Care, was uh, erected about 6,500 years ago and uh, was probably used continually for two to three thousand years. Two to three thousand years continual usage. And then it fell into disuse, large stones were rolled in front of the tombs and um, uh, they were forgotten. Uh, Mother Nature reclaimed their own. In the 1960s we know that this particular site was being quarried out by local uh, uh, stonemasons here in the area and uh, that, halt was, that, that practice was put a halt to in, in the late 1960s. Um, but uh, the Germans got here first in the 1940s. They did untold damage but in a way I think that is a unique structure. It is a tomb, it's an impressive tomb, but it's now been uh, built upon and its usage has been changed courtesy of a great war. Um, untold damage was done to it, but in its own way, its unique structure is important. And I find it fascinating because of that. So on our travels this morning, we've seen so far the world's tallest, largest single standing stone at uh, Loch Maricare. And you've now seen the only inbuilt German bunker built into a megalithic structure in the world. Um, so two unique artifacts here within miles of each other on the coast of Brittany in western France. Another aerial view of the uh, Great Cairn and Edouard's on, overlooking the sea, looking out towards its brother at Loch Maria Cairn. So we're just uh, walking around the tomb itself now. You can see the, the size of this thing. There are a number of these in Brittany. There's another one up on the northwestern coast of Brittany in a place called Finisterre, uh, called Barninares. And that's built out of uh, some beautiful red sandstone and limestone blocks. This, this one here again is built out of granite. Local building materials, of course. You just use whatever is available to you. And what a beautiful day today. Now, uh, just so that you know who is working with me today, Tony didn't come out with me today, uh, but another one of my Rick Steve's colleagues, uh, tours in Scotland, who also lives here in Brittany, uh, his name is Nigel Howes. Hey Nigel, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> day out in the sun. Day yeah? out in the sun, makes a change. <laughs> Thanks for your help, Nigel. No Appreciate well. it. Here we are, we have some uh, some locals enjoying the weather. See the uh, support stones, and you can see the capstone, or lintel if you wish to call it that, um, the entrance to uh, the tomb itself. It's been gutted inside, like I say, reinforced concrete fills the entire tomb now. Okay, so you uh, here to Chateau de Cicino. Um, chateau, castle, home small palace, all of the above, uh, but you can see a very, very impressive 15th century castle originally. Um, it served a purpose, some very famous people have lived here. Um, we're going to take a little wander around the outside, but uh, this really is just a little taster for what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. We'll be visiting places such as this and explain the history and the architecture. So, as I just said, essentially a 15th century castle. Um, however, it was built as a ducal residence uh, in the 13th century. So it has quite a history. Um, 
but it's just what you'd expect in a castle. It's a beautiful ruin, it's undergoing major restoration and reconstruction at the moment. I don't like that word, reconstruction, but uh, for tourist purposes, these things are an asset to places such as Brittany. So uh, a certain amount of reconstruction has to take place just to make them safe. And I can promise you, 10 years ago when I was first here, um, this building was falling down. You see the moat? stretches around the base of the, of the castle, uh, fed by salt water. Over here on the right, salt water marshes. This area of Brittany made great wealth in the 12th, 13th, 14th century in particular, courtesy of the salt marshes. Salt, of course, uh, was more valuable at certain times in human history than gold. We still have that word salary today, uh, taken from the old Roman cell salt and it was that salt the salt marshes that gave reason for people such as this to live in. We're going to go inside today, we're just going to have a look, as I say, this is a little taste of things to come. So here in the heart of Brittany, uh, we have a very French chateau or castle, I think. Well, yes, um, it's built by the Dukes of Brittany in the 1300s originally, and then it evolved and it grew. By the uh, 1700s, it was uh, uh, early 1700s. French chateau or home. Um, however, in the intervening years, you have uh, a situation where English kings, these people who would become English kings, stayed here. Uh, Henry IV, as he was to become, spent three years living here uh, with a retinue of about 400 to 500 armed guards and men. During the Wars of Roses in Britain, he found this to be a safe place. The Duke of Brittany was an ally and family member give the English nobility from that particular family, the Lancastrians, uh, succour and safety here in the heart of Brittany, whilst there was war raging on either sides of them. Mutually beneficial, um, the Duke of Brittany benefited from 500 heavily armed and well-financed men on his doorstep. Um, the English lords found benefit because it was safety here. They could increase their numbers, they could train, they could gather more allies for the war that was going on for years back home in England. But this was home to what was to become an English king. 